Um, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we will discuss uh, then later, so, uh, and then there will also the possibility to ask questions and so on. Uh, but now I um, continue um, and with my introduction, uh, or in this case, um, with Jonas Lund. Um, I try to be uh, fast. I see Jonas Lund uh, being in the tradition um, of the fir first net artists. He uh, reflects uh, issues related to the conditions of a network, um, but not so much uh, the contents of a network. In the early days of his research, um, of the possibilities of interaction, sharing, and collaboration in networks conditions, um, he developed an individual aesthetic uh, that was very reminiscent of the activities of Jody Ock and Alexei Shulgin, in my point of view. His investigation led him from the surfaces of a single server page all the way to browsers as net interfaces. Uh, he ruptured uh, the boundaries of software um, that he maybe hacked. The explorations are not just conceptual. And they are artistic works formulated in code. Following the definition of code cloning, Lund can therefore be positioned in the tradition of the deep internet artists of the first generation. So Jonas Lund, for me, as an artist who demonstrates that post-internet is just another label and an attempt to differentiate the first generation from net artists through the market strategy of uh, such as positioning of a new label, including concept and CI, etc. In a wider artistic engagement, questions about the rule of artists today, and particularly net artists, are being pushed increasingly into the foreground. The technical conditions of net art have been so drastically changed through the data bank driven dynamic websites and the totally and the total commonization of all web activity already at browser level. In particular, that the question of the critical position can no longer be determined by a single transgression of boundaries. Jonas Lund expands his investigation of individual network effects, like interaction, browser, servers, and so on. He investigates the phenomena arising from these change productions and distribution conditions of reception on a meta level. In his recent work, um, the network is no longer just an outpost or medium of propaganda distribution for galleries, artists, art historians, buyers, etc. He perceives the net instead like other net companies. Um, Lund exploits um, the accumulated data for his product. Lund highlights through his examination of the art business system, the interconnection of net, art data, uh, of net data and business society. This example, interconnection, leads him through various transformations and transitions between information, technology, and society. From immaterial forms and concepts to material fallout claiming its place in our existing world. His work, which I understand, as an investigation produces by means of rational description that which constantly eludes rational description, art. Art as the last bastion of magic, the conceptually slippery, the silent and unquestionable connection between form and content is presented here as a complex society interplay, as various permutations of all data from this social space. Jonas Lund must himself still choose, which generates a degree of ambiguity. What does an art object result from these possibilities? But in exactly this way, the work becomes for me more than a visualization of a given data set and strengthens the total force of this artistic meta-reflection of big data algorithms, market value, production, creativity, individuality, and what we understand as art today. 
At the same time, his work seems to me to be a reaction to art encountered in galleries today, which does not reflect its underlying conditions, which is often just a photo as documentation on, so on social networks of how art really looks. It's the way as Kim, Dawson, uh, Kim Asendorf described it. I liked it very much. Often art movements or a style seems to result from the fear of missing out, to be no longer visible. Visibility is one of the most pre precious assets sold on the network. He exams the thesis that art is not quanti quantifiable, quantifiable? <laughs> that's really hard, as through algorithmic experiments. And it turns out that at the same time, he puts a spot on the whole art context, the art system as exposed representation of our capitalistic system, in my opinion. So I would give it over to him. Hi. Thank you so much for that pretty awesome introduction. And I want to say thank you to the Transmediale for inviting me and to Sakowski for curating the show. I'm Jonas Lund. I'm an artist most of the time. And uh, before we start, I'm going to say that this talk is presented in collaboration with and support by Doltec, straightforward technology for you and me. Um, so the talk will be um, just a sh brief overview of some projects over the last two, three years, which are kind of connected to networked systems, like how things work. So like a pure networked system, like financial market systems, like service systems. Uh, thinking systems and systems of systems, but primarily one particular system which is the most fascinating, which is the art world system. Because no matter how much I work on this and try and figure out how the system works, I cannot understand anything. It's like a completely illogical summary of everything that I don't understand. So I'm trying to kind of uh, approach this system through different ways and doing different pieces in like operating within the system to kind of outsmart the art world to figure out a way around in the art world so I can kind of optimize my path and sort of develop strategies and to win the art world game basically so I started around two years ago by uh, uh, by building a database of the whole art world by scraping from Art Facts, Artnet, Mutual Art, and Art Scene. I collected artist institutions, galleries, curators, auction results, and exhibitions, and put it into a database. And but the sort of original motivation for creating the database was to um, through, take a systematic approach to this system, which I couldn't understand, and figure out how to operate and move within the system, figure out who the key players in this network like the art world network is, and then kind of hone in on these people. Um, so in the end, like these days, it's a database of half a million artists, maybe two and a half million exhibitions, 100,000 institutions, 100,000 curators, and a lot of auction results over the last years. This is all public information, so you can just download it. Just, just isn't any single place where all this data is shared with you in a kind of open and nice way. So the first work, like in the graph you see here, it's, uh, like it says database and then there's an arrow to an algorithm. So I've developed a couple of works in relation to this database and one of them is in the show, in the exhibition. So, uh, but I will back, back, like back in time a bit and start with the first work, which was the top 100 highest ranked curators in the world. So once I had all the data, I could like look at the data from different ways and so this is a uh, showing the top 100 most influential curators in the art world based on a curatorial ranking algorithm. So you take everything a curator has done from exhibitions and who, what artists the curator worked with and you weigh it against each other and then you get like a ranking and then you can sort them and then generate the piece which is just automatically googling for a face that matches the first name and you get like the uh, more like a uh, like a Facebook or like a yeah, like Facebook of who to look out for at the openings and who you should say hi to and who you should know if you want to like advance faster into the future. Um, uh, after this piece, it's, this is the predecessor to the piece that's in the show. The sh piece in the show is called Fix That For You. It's kind of a version of The Fear of Missing Out. So I'll talk more about this one. 
So this was an exhibition at Showroom Mama in 2013 in the fall. Using the database, it was also a lot of artworks in the database, and I wanted to see if I could kind of, by using the big data logic and the computational logic, see if I could take one step ahead of everyone by predicting where art production would be in the future. So it's a way of kind of sidestepping the fear of missing out because that would already be where other people would be later. So it's like an like a advancement. So by doing this, I used the database uh, of artworks in relation to artists and exhibition ranking and figured out the subset of the works in the database that was sort of in line with my practice based on the age of the artist and where they were in their career. These artworks were then ranked for complexity with this underlying assumption that the good work of art is very easy to produce but has a very high monetary value. So like something like um, Eve Klein monochrome seems at least that it's very easy to make and then it's worth a lot of money. Whereas like the Damien Hirst skull is very complicated because the production cost is so high that you can't produce it. And then based on the complexity, I could develop an artwork ranking algorithm, which I could then use to generate instructions for how to put together works of art. So in the show at Showroom Mama, there was 14 different pieces. For example, this one, which is a crashed motorcycle. It was called Travestier Luck 221. It um, was quite an easy one to produce. You just have to find the motorcycle. Uh, this is a single channel generative video installation for poster changers with line drawings on poster paper. It's called Storage Product Crosses. So the algorithm will give me a title, a description, materials, dimension, and a sort of simplified way of how to put it together. Which ranges from like put this thing in front of that thing or put this thing in this thing or hang this on the wall. It's just like verbs, like verbs telling you what to do with the piece. This is a ping pong table behind non-reflective glass. Um, facial mask product on canvas stool. And Steve Ballmer, fridge and six crates of beer. <laughs> uh, acrylic and silkscreen ink on custom rope. It's called Sh Shield Whitechapel Isn't Scoop. And this one is a cheerfully hats Sanders selfish. It's coconut soap, seven minute, 50 second video loop which was a complicated one because the instructions told me to put the video inside in the coconut soap, so I had to figure out how to produce that, which is fairly easy with just epoxy resin. You just put the monitor in epoxy resin, it's waterproof, put water, dissolve the soap. Um, this is called Description Albert. It's paint and ink on canvas with a black steel frame, and parachute faces, airways. It says the NSA hasn't been here yet, um, watch closely for the removal of this sign. Based on that story, that in a library in the U.S., you couldn't, you were not allowed to tell people that the NSA or FBI had been to the library, but you were allowed to not tell them. So, you could not not tell them by just removing the sign. Um, it's a horizon birth, grayish blue. It's uh, 250 kilos of concrete and plexiglass and plaster inside, and. Uh, uh, petrified wood with light emitting diodes. And here's the overview. So, uh, I mean, in some ways, it's like looking at a lot of this, uh, a lot of the kind of ideas of big data, the solution to everything, and algorithms have the key. And through this, you can kind of question who determines what's the formula for producing works of art, and is there a way to kind of step ahead of it and be faster at it? So, and also in a similar way, it's like the classic example of a feedback system, the kind of ideal cybernetic idea that the algorithm produces art, that it goes back to artsy, mutual art, artnet, and artifacts, and then becomes scraped again. And then the works I produce become part of the ecosystem that I'm sort of capitalizing on and using. So, in the case of the Transmedial exhibition, we chose, Sakrovsky invited me and he wanted to show the fear of missing out again and I figured um, we could like change it around to update it or not make it more specific towards the Transmediale. So rather than producing 14 new pieces for the show, we kind of, it augments the current exhibition. So it's all the lines that are on the, on the floor is kind of where the pieces would be and then it's just described through an audio tour by um, I think I can play you an example if it works. Work number 12. Yeah. Title, Monochrome Transparency, 2014. 
Materials. Coloured pencil mounted on panel with encaustic toy gun. Dimensions. 51 by 49 centimetres. The newly commissioned work compares the cybernetic theory of networked systems by using new hamburgers. Looking at the work, you see an array of thematically interrelated material extending towards the exhibition, rebelling a sense of the hidden materiality of our data, and the vibrating black and red colours separates the quantification link. By applying specific combinations, the artist has enabled the ambiguous relationship as a form of playful, neo-religious data invasion of privacy against the logic of the capitalist market system. The mappings becomes a combination of middle-class mentality and NSA logic, and spawns a condition of gain. Could the interference vision still be mapped and create expectations of yet another sequel for the new era? The immaterial, invisible cloud establishes the value. So it, it sounds like um, kind of art speak, hum, like gibberish, inspired by the Transmediale Capture All press release. Some ways. So I just wanted to, sh <laughs> no, but not inspired because that doesn't make sense, but inspired by the keywords used in the capture role. So I wanted just to show how it works because it's, I've been accused for making fun of the Transmedial exhibition, which is not the purpose of this piece. Um, so to generate the materials and the titles and the dimensions, the previous similar algorithms were used as in the previous case, although it was updated with the database of the Transmediales work for the last, um, last uh, since 2008. But for the description text, they use something called a spin tax, which is typically used for spammers to create unique comments. So basically how it works is when the opening curly braces, you have a pipe. So when you generate it, it will pick one of all the options in the curly braces. So through my spin tax, I could create a trillion, trillion, trillion variations of the press text. So it's like the major new work, the installation, the project, the piece, the newly commissioned piece, the video, the major new installation, the network sculpture, the mixed media installation, the newly commissioned by the artist. And then it just goes on and on. And it's quite long. So this is uh, a fifth of the text and then it uh, keeps on going. And then it's more. So, uh, so like every text, like every work follows a similar structure, but the meaning is completely different. Uh, I want to show two more works which are kind of connected to this previous work in the sense that I'm trying to kind of win the art world game or use the kind of metrics of the art world for my own information and practice. So this is an exhibition from last year which was more looking closer towards the kind of zombie formalism of the US art market. So I, it was a show uh, consisting of 40 different paintings and all the paintings were uh, outfitted with um, uh, produced based on auction results, kind of optimized from this, and then outfitted with a GPS tracker. So on the back of the stretcher bar, there's a GPS tracker, and it's operating with a SIM card and a lithium battery. And then once a day, it will send me the location of the painting through a kind of TCP socket. So I have a website connected to the piece which is flipcity.net, where you can see the current location of all the 40 paintings. So you have like uh, Flip City 1 is in Compton, N2 in Compton, Signal Hill, Los Angeles. And the um, thought is that by placing this into the art market and working with a, with a dealer based in LA, you can kind of track how the paintings will move around in the art world like in the art market rather, and then figure out how to kind of optimize this and see like where's the art stored and how often does it move around. And it has a specific terms of ownership stamped on the back, which includes that the owner may not tamper with the device and if he ever auctions it, he has to include a paragraph saying that the, the, the following owner needs to register his or her ownership with me on the website for the express purpose of replacing the battery in the GPS tracker, <laughs> which is lasting for three years, which is quite impressive. So in this case, you can see Flip City 34 was shipped to Bogota for an art fair. So it goes from LA to Mexico to Bogota and then ends up in El Segundo. I guess that's in California. Um, 
And somehow I imagine it, I know there's been a lot of talk about artists operating to making like Trojan horses and similar things. I think in these cases it's an almost, it's a good example of a Trojan horse because I figure out where the art storages are. <laughs> Although most of the paintings that were sold haven't updated their location because they end up in the basement in an underground storage where there's no GPS signal. Mm. And lastly, this is the last project I want to talk about, which is from last year. Um, I'll try and do it fast, and if something's unclear, just ask me some questions. Uh, it was a way of looking into the kind of artist as the businessman, entrepreneur, create my own kind of studio system with evaluating art. So what I did was I took the gallery and turned it into a factory under live surveillance for eight weeks, and I hired four, no, I hired five assistants to work for me during the opening hours of the gallery to produce work for me based on guidelines or mood book inspired by a book. And then once the work was completed, according to the assistant, they would upload it to the website where the work would be appraised by an advisory board. And based on the advisory board's advice, I would decide whether to sign it or not. It's kind of modeled after Olaf Eliasson's studio where he has like seances with his 40 plus assistants and they work on a project for four weeks and then they present it to him and he ends up saying, no, this is not an Olaf Eliasson work, try again. <laughs> so I wanted that for myself, but then also at the same time look closer at how this process works and uh, like figure out how I can like optimize it for myself. So in this case, this um, painting that you see was not approved for my signature, but it was rather designed. And this was my advisory board. And I think some of them are here today, so thank you for your advice. Then you can see the destruction advice at the end, and then when they're destroyed, they just stamp the big denied on the front of the canvas, so they can't be used. Uh, and the assistants had pretty strict employment agreements which outlines, outlines their rights and what they can and what they can't do and how much they're getting paid. So they're being paid 10 euros an hour for all the time in the gallery. And they're prohibited from discussing, documenting, photographing or sharing information or images in any forum, public or private, including but not limited to social platforms such as Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. And if they produced a work that got signed and sold, they would receive a 5% commission. So it was pretty, it was important to give the assistants fair pay uh, as part of the whole system. And this is the book which was made in an edition of one, which is the, it's not, special, it's not instructions, it's more like guidelines and inspiration for how to primarily produce process-based abstraction. So it's like an essay and kind of slogans, <laughs> like a sizing guide and kind of a meta commentary on like different things that's going on. Like trying to figure out how it operates and kind of advice that collectors don't want a unique original, they would prefer there were 15 of them rather than just one. Yeah, they're saying I'm out of time, so I'll just skip through all of these things. It's throughout the exhibition, we had some studio visits where we put up the work that was produced, and some of these were signed, most of them were destroyed. Uh, and then in the end of the last two weeks, there was no production, just uh, works awaiting approvals, basically. Okay, thank you.